Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. Really good to have you here. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's awesome to <laughs> to join in. It's yeah, kind of so, how I found you in the first place. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is true. And then we're now working together. But yeah. um, so you're in you're in Alberta, aren't you? In Canada. Yeah, Calgary, Alberta. In so Canada. you are in Canada, but you compete for Team Brazil. Just give people a little bit of a rundown of how that works and how that's come about. In summary, I guess to make it a little bit shorter, um, I am from Brazil. I was born in Brazil and moved to Canada uh, when I was younger. So I was seven years old when we first moved. And then we kind of bounced back and forth a bit um, between Brazil and Canada and then finally settled in here in Calgary. I've done all sorts of sports since I was a young kid. And I guess how Skeleton came up was um, the year I was doing a few things. I was competing in bodybuilding. So I had had my last show July, I think it was 2017. I was in school for nursing and working part-time at a supplement shop here in Calgary. And so it was one day I was working at the store and an old teammate of mine came shopping and found out I was Brazilian. And he's like, hey, I'm on, I'm, he was Brazilian too. He's like, I'm on the bobsled, Brazilian bobsled team. The female team is trying to find a new athlete or an additional athlete. And they're trying to qualify for the games, the winter games of Chang in 2018. And so he asked if I wanted to give it a try. And then long story short, I mean, initially I didn't even know what bobsled was, if I'm being honest. And once I kind of researched it a bit, I was like, ah, I don't know about this. Seems a little too, too crazy for me. But I got convinced. I tried it out and I really enjoyed it. I ended up doing a season of bobsled as a break woman. So that's the person that sits in the back of the sled and pretty much you run in the beginning and then you pray you don't crash and then you pull the brakes at the at the finish. I found out, I guess, in this whole journey that I I like to have a sense of control. So being in the backseat wasn't super great for me. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed the whole aspect of being on tour and being in that in that atmosphere with athletes from all around the world um, and competing at that high level. So I knew I wanted to come back but I knew I wouldn't be in the backseat. So I, in my head, I had either I'll come back as a pilot for bobsleigh or a skeleton athlete. And then that's when my, the Brazilian Federation was like, well, we've never had an athlete represent Brazil at the, at an Olympic games for skeleton. Did you want to give that a try? And at the time here in Calgary, we used to have a, a track it's closed now, but it was perfect because I would come home from work. This was once I was graduated, graduated from nursing. I was working here in Calgary. I would come home from work and kind of go to the track and train there too. But then since then it's been closed. But anyway, so I agreed to try skeleton and enjoyed it. And then, yeah, here I am. So anyone that doesn't really know what skeleton is, um, we've had Amy Williams on the show, but like it is essentially mm -hmm. just head first on your own on a baking tray. <laughs> That's right. Pretty much. With, yeah. With skates. What, <laughs> yeah. Because but, but it's so different from bobsleigh, though, because there's, there's essentially, I know crashes can happen, but like in a bobsleigh, you're protected. So you're far more vulnerable on a, on a, in a, on your sled. And like yeah. your, your, what is the thinking when you're changing from bobsleigh to skeleton? And is there any sort of like worries or is it just like, nah, this looks like a bit of fun. I want to do this. I think the difference for me was one, I was in control of, I said, okay. I like to say I was in control of my own bruises. Um, <laughs> it was me giving them to me and not someone else giving them to me. But in terms of safety, I mean, I guess at the same time, while it's nice being in control, you are in control. So you have to know everything. Yeah. A lot more, I guess, right? So when I was a, a break woman, all I had to worry about was training and just being fast and in the push. Otherwise, I didn't really have to know anything about the, the track and where which corners or where the corners went or how many corners there were. You usually knew, like we could count just to know, have an idea of when to pull the brakes. 
but in terms of knowing the intricates of the ice and the corners and how to steer them, I had no idea. So going into mm. skeleton, I had to learn all of that because now you're the one pushing it, you're the one driving it, and you're the one breaking it. So, and I guess again, in terms of safety, like you said, for bobsleigh, you are somewhat protected by that by the bobsleigh. I think pilots are more protected than the than the brake people are, just because they have the the nose of the the bobsleigh. They can kind of cave in, and a lot of times uh, for brake men and brake women, you end up getting either pushed out or your shoulders stuck out and you end up getting a lot of ice burns and stuff. And for skeleton, I mean, crashes do happen too. And I guess when they do happen, it's you and the ice and, and sometimes the sled flying. I have a video of a crash I had where I came off my sled and I tried hanging on. So you can see with the speed of it, the sled was above my head and I just couldn't hold on to it anymore with the one hand. So when I released it, it kind of flipped and landed on my head. So I was on the ice on my stomach with the the sled on top of my head. So, <laughs> so I mean, I was very, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was very fortunate that no major injuries happened from that. But like I said, yeah, crashes do happen, but I would say a lot less frequent than a bobsled crash were to happen. Why is that? Um, I don't know if it's just the, like, I guess when, when you watch as a spectator and you see a skeleton athlete going around a corner and it doesn't look right or the athlete normally can feel that and that's where you see like our legs spread or we're just kind of trying to counterbalance gravity whereas with the bobsled it's a lot harder and there are times i've heard where like a four-man bobsled so that's four people on the sled there's common corners where sleds tend to crash more often than not or more often than other corners and the brakemen will know. So sometimes if they can feel like if you're a more experienced brakeman, I guess sometimes they can feel and lean towards one side or the other to try and avoid that. But it's, I feel like that's tough to do, but yeah, I think I would assume that's why, I mean, our sled, we kind of cover most of it with our body. Whereas a Bob said, like, that's the whole thing you're driving. So mm-hmm. sometimes like our legs will flail but it's, we're not considered a crash until our sleds are kind of released, which is kind of silly too. Like for Kim, for example, she crashed last year in Whistler, but it was a terrible crash. She broke both her ankles and hit her head pretty bad, but never let go of the sled. And so it's technically not considered a crash, but clearly it was. So it's, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's it's weird. And when you've had a crash, is it, Is it kind of daunting to get back on or do you try to be as quick as you can get back on? I think it really depends on the person. Um, Some people after a crash, obviously depending on injuries, like to just get back on and kind of erase that out of your mind. And other people, if you're really injured, obviously you have to take some time off. Um, But if you're, not injured some people like to just kind of debrief a bit and see what went wrong and then maybe try again the next day but it it does i think if you have a crash and you have to wait till the next day to slide it does kind of you think about it a lot longer let's just say um and then i know for myself when i crashed in a certain corner the next run you go you're you're kind of tense in there and you're just trying to survive the corner so now you're not you're slowing yourself down so it it kind of takes a little bit to adjust back and to feel comfortable and confident in that corner again. Yeah, it's a it's a tough one. I can't really think of it. I've actually just started uh, longboarding, so like skateboarding. Okay, I, I, there's a new yeah. skill that I've started teaching myself, and I haven't fallen yet. And because I'm really slowly progressing, like slowly, and 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 it's literally one of those things where you find somewhere flat to start maybe like even uphill because you know you're going to break like there's no downhill downhill for me is like my next weirdly to say hill to climb but it's the hill to go down <laughs> hill to go <laughs> down the one, yeah. the, one, the one that i'm going down uh because for me stopping is the, the kind of the skill set that i want to learn how do you actually because clearly you're not well maybe you are this is this is the question are you starting skeleton from the top and just learning as you go or are there like when you go skiing, you go through the stages of your 
you know, is it blue, red, um, like a black runs? Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like you, you sort of, of go hills. through the, the difficulty of the runs. Um, it depends. So when you are first a beginner, then you there are different openings in the track. So they'll send you from a lower opening. Right. So, okay. for example, when I first you. tried skeleton, they sent me from a lower corner. And it's it was when I first tried it, it was for it was a public session. So basically anyone can go sign up and do this. And the point of it is just to kind of feel what it's like, but you do no steering. You don't need to do any steering. So you're not getting enough speed or enough pressure that you're going to crash. So you're just laying there pretty much. And then once you get comfortable with that, they'll kind of move you up. And then ideally you have a good coach and, and they're teaching you as you go up the theory of skeleton and how you drive the sled and how you gain control and then as, yeah, as you're moving up the track, you start to figure things out. And then at this point, like I, myself, I think, well, I wouldn't go down from a lower corner, let's just say, even though there are tracks in the world where I haven't been down often, this is for most, like, let's say a world cup athlete, you've been around for so long, you know, the theories of skeleton and pressures and feelings that even if you're going to a new track, you generally will just start from the top and kind of you study the track through point of view videos. Um, so you have an idea of what they're like. And again, you since you understand the concept and the theories, it's okay to go from the top. But I do know some World Cup sliders that will sometimes like Whistler here in Canada, there's a track in British Columbia, and it's considered one of the fastest tracks in the world. So we're not here often for competition. So when it is in the calendar a lot of people i guess get a little bit afraid because they haven't been here for a while um, even if they are world cup athletes and so i do that is one track where i see even experienced athletes will go from a lower corner just to kind of and it, it might just be one run just to feel confident or a little bit less uh or more at ease so yeah there is there are steps to getting to the top of a track but eventually I think you just end up going from the top. Like next year when we start, so we we get seven months off between seasons, I guess, um, or actual sliding. And when I start next year, I I likely will just more more than I'm pretty sure I will be starting from the top, let's just say, for all the tracks that I've been to. So yeah, yeah. So when I was watching one of your, I can't remember which venue it was at, one of the World Cup meets. And it started raining. And as it was raining, the, the commentators were saying, or they were discussing like how that changes the conditions. And I, I'd never actually really considered it. Like obviously water and ice, like that's that's a combo that you don't really want too much and it changes everything. But when you've got essentially a sport that you are your goal is to try and have as minimal errors so that you can go as fast as you can, and the conditions are not favorable what can you do or what do you try to do? What's the things you focus on when those conditions aren't in your favor and you've got to try and put in the best performance you can? I think it's a little bit of what we talk about a lot of worrying about what you can control and not what you can't mm. control. Obviously, Mother Nature, we can't control. And it was something we were just talking about yesterday because Kim and I were training um, on the track around a hockey arena that was here. And before every session, they had the Zambodis out to clean the ice. And like the ice looked perfect for every session. We're like, oh, that would be nice if we had it. Um, but then I'm like, wait, we're actually outside. Like this is all controlled environment. It's always the same temperature for the most part. So it's easy to get good ice in a hockey arena. But now we are outside. So we're exposed to whatever weather ends up happening. Obviously, the season is determined before we can even know what the weather might be like. So a lot of times it's tricky because we get after COVID, we ended up getting only two days of training and then one day of slide or of racing. So we would train Monday, Wednesday, and then race Friday. And a lot of times during the season, we had totally different weather conditions, mm -hmm. which means different ice conditions for every training. And then a completely different one for, for racing, which makes it tricky because we have, run we call it runners under our sleds. So that's essentially the, the blades, I guess you could call it. 
that go under. And based on ice conditions, we use different cuts of them. Um, because if we have too sharp of one on a, let's say on ice, that's really soft, it's going to carve a lot of the ice and then make you go even slower. So it makes it tricky because yeah, if we have two days of training where it's, I don't know, let's say frosty conditions. And then on race day, they prep the ice and the weather is beautiful. And now it's super glossy and super hard and super fast. Then what we, the equipment we used for training won't apply to a race, which makes it kind of fun because it's like, okay, well, who's going to figure it out kind of thing. Um, yeah. But it can also be very frustrating. So a frustrating example would be during a race. Um, there's obviously ranks, I don't know, numbers one to 20, let's say 20 athletes. And so the first will go first, the 20th will go 20th, but 20th place is already going like 40 minutes to an hour after the first place. So timing also matters because they prep the ice. So they put a layer of a thin layer of water before the race starts to make it as fast as they can. And so there's times where depending on the weather, the first sleds have more advantage to it better ice conditions than the last mm. so when it snows it's it's shitty because yeah first ones get a fresh sweep then you go and then they have different protocols but usually after the third sled it's like after the third sled they sweep so now if you're the third sled you're there you've already wasted four or five minutes before you're going so there's four or five minutes worth of snow in the track for you yeah so it's it's not super fair often and it's just again not something we can control so you kind of said like figuring it out and i was having this conversation with uh another athlete recently about when you have crappy conditions when things just aren't in your favor it's really easy to completely like fall to those conditions and just go well today's not my day and i, I can't do this and this is no way going to be i'm able to put in a good performance and i was like well why can't you just change your perspective on it and actually see it as a puzzle like you said there who who's going to figure this puzzle out the most who's going to figure out what 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 runners work best on today's conditions what equipment's going to be right how do you go about it and and in the sport we it was cricket we were talking about so the pitch the actual the ground and the turf that you play on changes every game changes every day like every day is never the same day so I said, like, instead of just going, oh, well, today's not my day, today's not my day, then why not just actually see it as like this fun little challenge and puzzle that you've got to figure out? And that actually is just a different form of you showing how good an athlete you are because you're showing a different skill set, sure. which is my ability to... I think when people say, oh, your ability to adapt, like, well, what does that look like? Yeah. My, my ability to adapt would be my ability to figure out this puzzle, which are these crappy conditions that instead of me just being complacent and saying oh well these conditions don't work i'm actually going to figure this out i'm actually going to try and find a way to get to the result that i need which is a good run a good result a good game whatever it might be yeah for sure and i think it's also a confidence thing too like to mm. to confidence and maybe a trust thing where you're trusting you're just made the right decision and you can't keep thinking on it and you know you this these are the runners you decided on and as soon as you pull them out at the track you can't go back and change it so um, I think it's, you figure you figured out the puzzle, you tell yourself you figured it out, you put it on your sled and kind of forget about it because you can't, can't be kind of in, indecisive, let's just say when you're on the sled. So, mm. And you want to try and train in crappy conditions as well. Like you're saying there when you're on the ice in hockey with the Zamboni, just putting on perfect ice, like you're not going to get that every day so it's it's like don't train in perfect conditions because the reality is going to be so far from it go find some really challenging conditions to to train in so that when you do get really good conditions or the conditions are definitely better than what you've trained in you you're going to smash it you're going to, it's going to be so much better than everyone else but yeah i think exactly. i see i see a lot of people trying to be look good in training and be like oh well, i feel good in training feel good and then there's no sort of failure there's no sort of uh for sure messing it up and it being ugly because that's reality I, a rate like how many competitions have we spoken about where it's just kind of it's just gritting it out it's just ugly and it's not pretty because that's just yeah. not reality it's never the world isn't nice to you in that sense 
for sure. Um, I think it, there's a limit to that in our sport in the sense of if mm. it's snowing a lot or if the ice is really crappy, it just, it changes. Like we can go, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot in our sport. We can go anywhere from two, three, four, five seconds slower than yeah. normal conditions. And in that case, the pressure changes and how you're steering the corners changes. So at that point it's like, okay, is it really worth even taking a run in this ice condition? Because we're never going to be racing in this. Um, and it almost just messes you up because you're, if you're trying something new in a corner, you now you can't do it because the pressure is going to hit you different. Yeah. So there's limits to it as well, but, but yeah, for sure. You've touched on it already. And I'm going to go into this subject is that your partner, Kim, you train together, but you also, this is where it just blows my mind is that you compete against each other. <laughs> so yeah. I want to know that I want to dive into the dynamic and how you've managed to to navigate that space and, uh, yeah. and also where you're at now with it. Yeah, I think it's, we, we wondered before if there was anything like it that we can think of. And I, can't, I guess I, honestly, see... I've been speaking to people and I, I can't think of anything like it. I know yeah, I've, I've I had think... Lauren Smith on the podcast and I've spoken to Lauren before. And Lauren is a um, badminton player for England and she okay. competes with her boyfriend as doubles. That's yeah. the only, but that's not, it's not competitive. They're actually working together. Right. Then, and there's that. I think as you, you dive get, into um, this, you're going to, like team, yours is more team sports. Yeah. Team sports. Like I know soccer and hockey, you, you get a lot of yeah. couples, but again, working for the same team. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think it was an interesting beginning where we had to adapt to a lot of things, but it's also different in the sense that skeleton we're not head to head with each other per se. It's kind of us, me against the clock and her against the clock. Mm -hmm. And then the results are the results. Like I don't influence her and she doesn't influence me, let's just say yep. while I'm racing in inside the track mentally, obviously it's a different, a different game. And when we first started dating, I think it was, took a lot of adapting for me, especially I'm a very, I, I, like to say it, a selfish person and I'm I'm very competitive in the sense that I will do everything for me to do as best as I can whereas she's more of she's more of the emotional side where she loves to help obviously people who she wants to help and so she it was always like a dynamic a hard dynamic between me being like ah, I don't know if I want to share this and her being like okay well here's everything I have for you to know so I think it got to a point where we're like, okay, this is, this isn't going to work out because she's like, I feel like I'm giving you everything I know, but you're holding things back for me. And so we, we kind of discuss like, what's the best? Do we both not share information? Because obviously at that time we were working separate. So she had her own team and coach and I had my own team and coach, um, but we were trying to stay in the same accommodations, but then to do video review and like coaching analysis and stuff. It was all different spots. Um, but yeah, we, I guess our first year we decided, okay, we'll kind of keep everything to ourselves unless like, if she had a question for me, I'm happy to answer. And if I had a question for her, she's happy to answer, but we weren't going to openly share, let's just say just for the sake of it. Um, so that was the first year. And I mean, I think we agreed that if we are going to be working together and trying so Belgium and Brazil are two nations that are, I guess, considered small nations in the sport in the sense that we're pretty much the only athletes for our nations. So it's hard to navigate the sport against other bigger nations like the UK, for example, or Germany used to be Canada, US, like they have more of a formal structure with multiple athletes, multiple coaches. So for us, I think teaming together with small nations works better because we have more resources to share. So we realized quickly that if we wanted to kind of be beating these bigger teams, well, we'd have to work together. So yeah, we kind of adjusted to working as a, an official team together. Um, we named it team BB Belgium, Brazil. And um, yeah, so I think since then it's kind of open books and we, we share a lot of different things. We help each other with, video corners and stuff. I think it's just a mental change in the sense that 
today I would rather her be first place in the podium and me second than me first and her not be there at all or her first and me not be on the podium at all. So it's kind of each of us helping each other to to both be on that podium. I think that's maybe a, a goal of ours is to have both of us step on the podium. And Kim's obviously been, well, she has been sliding for way longer than I have. She's been in the sport for, I think she's going into her 13th or 14th season, whereas I'm going into my sixth season. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool exchange of viewpoints, let's say. So she's been sliding since she was young. She has ways that are kind of stuck to her now that she, I see she does and she shares with me and I learn a ton from it. But then I also have that fresh point of view to share. And I think we see it in the sliding where I'm a little bit more, I could take a little bit more risks because I'm, I guess, more oblivious to things that could happen. So I just go for it and do it and trust and because I don't have all the knowledge, I depend on my coach sometimes. So he's like, Oh, try this. And I'm like, okay, sure. I'll do it. Whereas for her, it's like, try this. She's like, okay, well, I know this could happen and this could happen. So then she's not willing to take that risk more. So then I'll do it. And she's like, okay, well it can work then. So then she'll go and do it. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun dynamic in that sense. And then obviously accommodations and all that we, we do ourselves because we are a small nation. So it makes it easier working together as a team to be able to find just one place for us and our coaches. And yeah, so that's kind of how it works. Have you received in the past or still currently any sort of outside noise about you being together and working together? And yeah, has that Um, played a role? I, I wouldn't say so. I was quite surprised. So Kim is my first girlfriend that I've had at, Previous to that, I always had boyfriends, let's say, so dated men. Um, And yeah, when I came out, I was pleasantly surprised with very, very little to none, no like negative comments or anything. It was people were quite supportive and have been. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that. She, I think in her lifetime has had more backlash than not, but I don't even think it was in the sport per se maybe a couple times in the sport but mostly just general public stuff Mm. but yeah has speaking of support with the fan base in brazil has because it has surprised me has it surprised you at all because obviously people think of brazil they think of football straight away they just i think that's just what's where i go um yeah and yeah, has it surprised you the support you've got? Because I know you're very you're you're very grateful for that support, but has it surprised you just how much there has been? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think um, especially because it's such a new sport. I was pretty much the only, the first person to introduce skeletons into Brazil, and that was through the game. So most of the majority of my supporters today that are from Brazil, and like my my Instagram, I guess followers of percentage of brazil to canada pretty much flipped when after the games Mm -hmm. um but they were super good just media wise like throughout the whole season there was multiple media um, platforms interviewing and i i just tried to really get it out there um i mean it's sad that it only really happens the year of the games but i mean at, at least it happened um, so there I a lot of people started to follow and kind of get to know the sport and and then after the games like the media in Brazil during my runs were very good like the the biggest sports channel ended up streaming it so they cut out I think it was volleyball that was going on which is pretty big in Brazil too yeah yeah um, and they cut out the volleyball to play my run so tons of people watched it and it's so one of those sports, Kim and I talk about it a lot because obviously we're always trying to find ways to get people to know the sport, whether it be for sponsorship reasons or whatever. It's a cool sport and it's comparable to a lot of sports that people really enjoy and and sports that are super well supported. But for whatever reason, skeletons kind of still hidden under the carpet. So I think a lot of people, yeah, did find out what skeleton was after the games in Brazil. And that's where the support has come from. I was at the games just 
crazy, just crazy um, amounts of support that I got from there and people wanting to know more. So I'm not very good with making videos and I guess posting about the sport. And that's what I'm hopefully going to get better at. But uh, I do have a YouTube channel and there's not much on there right now, but I think at some point I would like to, and I've talked to Kim about this, like do, do some videos to kind of explain more of what the sport is. Mm. I know like formula one has gotten huge now after the Netflix series and like the, the, the show that was going on. And so I think just having it more exposed and skeletons, one of those things where you Google it and you can't find information on. So I think it'd be cool to come from someone who, from an athlete that does it, that knows all the intricates and the details from it. So that might be something that might come up in the future a little bit more, but yeah, it's crazy how much support I've gotten and how many people truly do follow and will wake up in the middle of the night to watch a race and, and cheer me on and post about it and all of that. So it's cool because yeah, like I said, no one knew what skeleton was prior to the Beijing games in 2022. Yeah. And Brazil's got this, there's a few sports. Like I just recently was looking at cricket in Brazil and there's loads of that going on. And then there, I'd, I'd got in touch with a rugby coach in Brazil and yeah. there's, I didn't realize the amount of rugby that was going on over there. Like that you do forget how big a nation it actually is. Like it is absolutely huge. And the amount of people there, For so sure. of course, the amount of sport that could potentially be in there and the, the talent pool could be huge. So but yeah, and it's it's fun to sunshine too, is the one thing you associate it with, <laughs> not snow. Yeah, exactly. And even with like football being so popular there, I've obviously grown up. Well, I grew up listening to soccer games and and people or watching soccer games on on TV. Soccer versus football, it's the same to me. I I interchange those words, but yeah, I had uh, the opportunity to go on a podcast, one of the bigger sports podcasts in Brazil. And part of that podcast, they sent in like fan videos and one was, was this clearly a football fan and he, but he pretty much converted all his football fan words and cheers to me. And it was cool because it had switched from football to skeleton, but it was still that, that vibrance and that energy that you get from like super keen sports fans or soccer fans. Yeah. It was, it was cool to see. And actually when they, they played the video on on TV, like of me of my live run. I went back and watched it after, and they they speak about it exactly in the same tune and energy as they would a football game. So it was actually quite fun to watch. And you you speak fluent Portuguese. I do. So yeah, you, that that makes it a lot easier as well for you to completely access everyone. You're not. There's no language barrier for you, which is which is totally. amazing. It makes it a little bit tough because my fa- my followers right now are, I'd say, a little bit more Brazilian than Canadian. But then when I'm posting stories or when I'm posting photos, yeah. it's like, do I have to? Do I speak in English? Do I speak in Portuguese? Do I put subtitles? Like, what? How? How? I've do seen I you doing both sometimes, where you put like a text one up. You got to do the English one, then the then the Portuguese or the Portuguese then the English one. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's difficult. a it's a tough one. Well, the technology is getting there now, so that there will just be subtitles on anything, re- regardless whether it's in Portuguese, it'll pick it up, and then sp- uh, and in English. Yeah, like it's it getting just, better uh, for sure. Yeah, you'll be fine with that. I was going to mention that I the the popularity of the sport and the ease the ease to actually get into it and to to watch it is is awesome. Like just being able to watch some of the stuff on YouTube, just the live. And the brilliant thing is, from a sporting perspective, right. It's quick, literally. It's very quick, and the the competitions like you don't need to know. I think from a, a very beginner baseline, you don't need to know too much about. There's no rules that you need to really know about f- for it for it to be enjoyable from a spectator. It's, it's slide, like yeah. who is the fastest. It is literally like who's yeah. got the, sm- the shortest time, and that I think creates a really great spectator part of it because I found myself just watching it and just through both heats and you're like right i don't need to know all the intricacies here i just want to who's who's gonna who's gonna go faster and you see totally. well, I think and, when and even when watch... you know someone's sliding wrong like this just oh look and that's it becomes interesting 
Yeah. And I think when you watch, it's more of a curiosity thing. Like you don't need to know, but you get this curious, like how do, how do we slide that sled or turn, turn the sled? How do we break? How do we, what do we see? Like, it's just, I think a lot of questions and details that you get curious about, but not necessarily that you need to understand to know who's going to win or see who's winning. Yeah. And the, and you, I think when you're watching it, you put yourself it on it as well. You, you kind of put yourself in it and go, I wonder what that's like doing that and totally. obviously I, I, I there's almost no way in hell i'm doing that there's something <laughs> so far removed from me and i know we did this questionnaire recently to find out like what you felt was were really good traits of a skeleton um athlete and you were you you put we put like a i think it was something like um like a thirst for adrenaline and or, or like the fact that it need, yeah it needed adrenaline and you put it quite low score and essentially it was like because you find roller coasters like nothing like absolutely nothing it's just totally and i think it goes back to you. that I, we've we've talked about it but it goes back to that control aspect when i'm on a roller coaster it's not me driving that thing and i don't know what's going to mm. happen you know i'm at the hands of someone else so i think like i'm not a roller coaster fan at all and I've, I know for myself, I've been in the back of like a jet ski. And again, I did not enjoy that, but driving it's no problem. <laughs> so I think it's just, yeah, I like the adrenaline, but if I can kind of control how f- much of the adrenaline I get. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one other thing about you is that you're also a qualified nurse and you are working with that and being an athlete or you have been and that is a part of your life. So what was your passion for even getting into medicine? Yeah, I think uh, as since I was a small child, I always wanted to go into med school. I always wanted to become a doctor. So how it happened was I graduated from high school and still had the idea of going into medical school. But I got a scholarship at the time I was playing football and I got a scholarship to play football at a smaller college here in, in Alberta that had a limited amount of courses to choose from, but they did offer a Bachelor of Science, which is pretty much what you need to take prior to applying to uh, medical school. So I did my first year Bachelor of Science. I did not love it. It was just, it was a lot of labs and, and things I didn't enjoy. And so I knew, I still wanted to go into med school, but I knew that if I, after four years, had a Bachelor of Science, I would have to go back to school if I decided I didn't want to go into med school anymore. So I kind of wanted to start a bachelor that I could have a career out of after the four years, but that I could also apply into med school. So I started taking nursing and um, I moved to a different school, also got a scholarship to play football there. So I played football there for another year and started a nursing degree. At that time, um, I kind of it was it was a lot of the schooling was hard and I think with the schooling and then having to be competitive with soccer it got a lot for me and so I decided I didn't want to play competitive soccer anymore so moved back home to Calgary and then graduated from the university here in nursing so yeah graduated from nursing and realized I didn't want to go into med school so I'm grateful I chose that route um, and really really fell in love with nursing and I've always loved children, so I'm specialized in pediatric nursing. Um, I was also working at a post-cardiac surgery unit with adults. Um, but yeah, it's a tough balance to kind of, I'm I'm an all-in or not in at all person. I think this has been the way I'm 100% into skeleton, but I'm 100% into nursing. So it's tough, tough to balance them when I have to mix them together in a sense of, I really love my career and I would love to advance it, but it's, it's something that I have to be here physically for in order to do. So I think, yeah, nursing has kind of taken, not that I'm, I mean, the, the goals I have for it, I can't just reach just yet because I would like to, for example, um, go into emergency nursing and, and do more critical care. But it's tough because I have to be there constantly to keep my skills in base. And especially because I'd be learning a lot of things, you have to be there hands on deck constantly. And I'm not able to do that because I'm gone for six months of the year. So the first little bit that I graduated, I graduated in 2018. And then that same year I started Skeleton. 
So it took me a while because I would work for six months while training. So I couldn't really work super full time or consistent hours, let's just say. And then I was gone for six months and being freshly new when I came back, it's kind of like having to learn it all again. Um, today, it's a lot easier. I've worked enough hours that I'm I'm comfortable going back. But yeah, I had to drop the um, adult position I had because it was just it's it was more critical care. But it was just hard to keep up with the skills and and everything while being away. And then so basically, when I was here working the two different units, it's two different hospitals and training. So I was trying to keep my skills up for adults, pediatrics, and train. So that just ended up getting, I did that for four years, but it just got a little too much. So yeah, now I'm just in pediatrics and and training. But Do you think the critical care comes from, again, a need or like desire for these emergency, like high octane adrenaline rush situations? Yeah, I think so. And I really like the idea of just being able to go to an emergency and just know what's happening and know what needs to be done. Um, Mm. I don't like to kind of be unsure of what might, what we might do or have to depend on someone to kind of tell me what to do. Um, obviously being a nurse, you still have to wait and talk to doctors and stuff, but just having that, if you're in an emergency, you just know what's happening and what you have to do. So I love the idea of being able to, to do that. So that might be something that'll come up once I've retired from skeleton and have more time to focus just on my career. So, yeah. And you've, you've already got that sort of vision in place, which is way ahead of tons of athletes who are still competing. Sometimes they don't know what they're going to do after. And then that becomes a really tricky period. Whereas I think your transition, even from just our conversations, I think your transition is almost, there's a foresight of what it might look like. And, and, because you're already skilled in the area that you're going to go into there's passion along with it there's even development like you've just said there there's development options for it so it just makes it so much nicer and it's actually i think your 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 challenge has been balancing it but i think it's such a nice example of okay even if you have this passion even if you have this other thing in your life that you can chat you can go after and be an athlete at the same time one can take priority. And I've been talking to peace and people about balancing their lives around having this work-life balance or sport-life balance. And like there is there is no such thing as having a 50-50 perfect balance if you want to be really good at both of them. So like what you've mm-hmm. been talking about is like when you're not competing or you're not training, you're working and you're fully into that. And then when you're actually training and competing, you're fully into that. But I think people especially in business, I think people think that in order to get this like perfect work, work-life work balance, it has to be like every day has to be 50-50. I don't think that's a reality. I don't even think it's possible, if, especially if you want to be good at what you do. There's just going to be totally. moments where you have to sacrifice certain things. And then, in my opinion, you just zoom out, like zoom out and go, well, is my life more balanced than it is unbalanced? If it's not, mm-hmm. then I need to find pockets where I do settle down into recovering from or or having time off from my sport and having time off from my work or whatever it might be and then moving into another interest whereas if i think if you try to have like work-life balance every day or of every week you'll actually not really be good at anything you're just gonna dilute yourself you need to have pockets of like sprinting working hard towards whatever it is and then rest recuperate change that whatever it might be to other different interests Yep, absolutely. And I think sometimes they can get caught in thinking, oh, I could have been so much further in my career than I am today had I not done skeleton. But then had I not done skeleton, I wouldn't have achieved what I achieved in skeleton. So Mm -hmm. it's at the end of the day, it's yeah, what you said, I think it's 50-50, but almost in a spread out more over overlooking way not day-to-day 50-50s. Are there attributes that you have had or you've learned and believe are important from being an athlete that you take into nursing or you will take into nursing in the future? I think they kind of mix and match, but like what I learned from one, I apply to the other. But um, I think staying calm in crazy situations is one thing that I don't know if I got from nursing, if it's inherited or if it's something I learned from skeleton. Um, But it's something that I'm able to apply to both. I think just 
dedication and working hard towards what you actually want to do and having crazy dreams, but realizing that they, they do actually, they are possible. I think those things, again, I don't know where one comes from or what came first, but I think it's attributes that I apply to both. Yeah. I think I can't really think of anything on the spot right now, but Hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you're, it's just quite clear that your your desire and your importance of staying controlled under very hectic situations is something that you're one working on, good at, and that you are also drawn to. That for yeah. sure is you're drawn to it for sure, just through everything that you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So I don't know which one comes first, or if it's just something I'm inherit like inherently born with, but yeah. It's probably there, where I am today. <laughs> is there anything your family had done where, or like anything, any experiences in your upbringing that you were like, this, this is something that I, I started to, that part of you started to feel like it was coming out or you'd had an experience when you were younger where you maybe weren't in control and actually were like, I wish I was better there and then started driving towards it. Or you actually were and, and you felt that sense of adrenaline and wanted that, that chaos and to be calm in the storm. Um, I think the fact that my parents always put me in sports since a very young age, my parents both did sports too, uh, obviously helped me develop as an athlete. And the fact that they sacrificed so much to come and move to Canada, like they had three kids at the time, didn't speak the language at all and just packed everything up and moved for a better life for us. I think that makes me work a little bit harder because Like there were so many times in university where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. My parents were like, okay, come on, at least finish it. If you don't want to do anything with nursing, you don't have to, but just finish it. And I think a lot of things that I did and do is to kind of be able to say thank you back to them for having moved and having made that sacrifice. Like if I don't think today I would have ever done something like they did. Mind you, I, I I have heard having children is a different, you change as a person, but yeah, to, to think of having three kids and just completely moving across the world um, to some place unknown is, um, yeah, it's not something that I would be, would be top of my list, let's just say. So I think I do things to kind of give back to them and yeah, it's grown me to who I am. It's adrenaline rush in its own right now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, on just before we sort of wrap up, a few sort of technical questions from the world of skeleton. Like, what does uh, the nutrition of an athlete like yourself look like? Because I I had this really interesting moment where one of my old physios worked with the, the Team GB bobsled team, and a lot of the guys were former sprinters. And I know you do a lot of power work and speed work and strength work to to be strong at the start and fast at the start. But then he would talk about how they would train and then like they would eat literally Burger King on the way home because they had to be heavy. So they they were these like sprinters that just needed to be heavy because they needed to move a lot of weight quickly, which was really interesting. Uh, it's probably changed now. It's probably different. They've probably found a new way of doing it. No, but um, I, I would right. say it's still very much the same. I was quite shocked in it too, because like I said, I joined, I started bobsleigh prior to skeleton. And before that, I was doing bodybuilding competitions. So I was literally, I would, I knew how many grams of rice I was eating, how many grains Mm, pretty much of rice I was eating. So everything was weighed and everything was measured. And it was always like the healthiest foods and you didn't eat outside of it for anything. And so my last show was July, 2017. And by September, 2017, I was doing bobsleigh. And they told me, look, you have to put on at least 20 kilos or we can't have you in the sled because there's a sled max. And if you're underweight, then obviously you're going slower, just fact of gravity. And so they're like, well, if you, if you don't put weight on, you can't slide. And I'm like, well, what's the point of me being here if I can't slide? So yeah, I had to put on weight. And that was, I think, mentally a really hard period for me because like it or not, when you're doing bodybuilding for a long time, I think you do end up forming some forms of eating disorders, let's just say, or body dysmorphias. Yeah. And so going straight from a competition from a bikini where they're where the smallest and thinnest girls there to body uh, bobsledding where I had to be 20 kilos heavier. And it's just like, I have no time to 
to put on muscle. It's, you know, it's fat that you're putting on. I think that was mentally really hard, but yeah, I was super shocked coming into the bobsled world and everyone's just eating pizzas and, and burgers and like not super healthy stuff. So I'm, I'm like, this is top level of a sport here, elite sports, but yeah, you see it's a lot. And I'm not saying that's hundred percent their diet, but it, no, on tour, yeah. I think it's a little bit easier to go that route. There's the other side around it as well. Like they're super hot and they're shit hot on their recovery. Their, their, their training schedules are tight. Like they don't, it's genuinely the the routines behavior. Your nutrition is one area of it. So if your nutrition for the functionality of the athlete you need to be happens to be like highly calorific foods, then that's what you got to do. But it, totally. to be a fully functional athlete, like there's so many other realms of it. Like, yes, if you are trying to be a marathon runner, that may not be the best diet. Like you have to bolt in the right diet for that sport. So it just so happens <laughs> that your yeah. sport require can can take on that diet. So I think that's worthwhile for the listeners to to take on. Like that's not necessarily that every sport is going to be well receiving to that that diet because it's not yeah. specific to your sport unless you're doing something like yours where it's and about it's, weight. Yeah, and it even changes a little bit when you cross over to skeleton from Bob Say. So for Bob Say, it's a lot of the men that have to be super heavy because if they're in the four man side or two man side. Um, and they have this, these max weights that are quite large. Um, but then for skeleton, you have people who are struggling to, to stay within the weight limits. Um, and then in their case, yeah, they're having to, to diet or to mm. focus a little more on, on the nutrition aspect of things, which makes it really tough on tour because the first couple of years that I was on tour, uh, we stayed or I stayed at hotels a lot and it was mostly in Europe they call a pension, like full pension, half pension. So it's the meals that the hotel provides for you. So you just wake up, you go to downstairs and they have breakfast, lunch and dinner. So you literally had zero control of what was being made. And in Germany, especially like a lot of things are heavy on the sauces and they're not necessarily cooking for athlete and health in mind. So that was really tough too, because I, again, with um, coming from bodybuilding, I would track everything I ate. And so being on tour and not have, being able to do that was really tough. And I just kind of learned, I mean, I've, I've tracked food enough to know what's a protein, carbs, fats and stuff. So I have a better sense of what is on my plate. I said it, bodybuilding has kind of ruined me in the sense that I can't look at a plate of food and be like, oh, that's just food. I know it's, oh, there's fat, there's protein, there's yeah. carbs, there's, you know, so um, I mean, it, it, it's ruined me and slash helped me also because yeah, I can go on tour and then set up a plate where I'm comfortable with. I'm still very, you can ask him, I'm very health focused, I guess, in when it comes to nutrition. Um, I try and eat as healthy as I can. But yeah, on tour, it can be hard. And the last two years, we've stayed at mostly at Airbnbs or houses where we can actually cook our food. So that makes it a lot easier. We just grocery shop for ourselves and and then cook meals uh, for the team. So, But it's, it's tough though in it's really interesting that you were in body bodybuilding and then gone into skeleton because bodybuilding is an aesthetics based sport and it's and a competition whereas what the sport you're playing is or you're racing in is a functional in, environment performance, so yeah yeah it's completely performance driven like you don't you're not you're not scored on how you look like you're just scored yeah, no. on how well how well you do so it's an interesting one because as well like bodybuilders look like they, they have these physiques that look insane and at the same time they're actually really unhealthy like i've met totally. loads of bodybuilders in the gym that i used to go to that were very unhealthy like there's no it's not health it's not really it is purely aesthetics i think it's fair to say that if you take any sport at a its highest level yeah. it's not healthy um, yeah. and it's funny because the general public views all these elite athletes as being the optimum health, let's just say, but if you really think about it, you're pushing your body to extreme limits. Um, you're tearing muscles, you're tearing, breaking bones, you're feeding it high caloric content that you shouldn't normally be feeding it. So I think at, at ex like elite athletes sports and elite athletes are at an, at an extreme end of the scale. And just like anything else, I don't think either extreme is where you want to be. You want to be in the middle, right? So I think, yeah, it's 
kind of sacrifices that you have to make for each sport. And I did realize the difference, like being bodybuilding, I think I was able to work on tons of little muscles that maybe I don't like necessarily train specifically for, for skeleton, like skeleton were more the fast twitch muscles, which I did zero of. So for bo bodybuilding, I was doing large sets of 10, 20 reps and, and trying to max out my deep squats and all of that. And even I did CrossFit and, and weightlifting prior or during my skeleton career as well. And I found that didn't make me fast either because you're just, you end up having so much more muscle that it gets in the way of sprinting. Mm. So it's been a lot of, it's been a journey trying to accept the hundred percent training of skeleton, um, which involves pretty much we train like sprinters. So we do a lot of sprinting in the summer and, and then yeah, fast switch plyometric lifts as well, uh, but just lighter and more explosive stuff. So um, yeah been an adaptation all the way around it's a really good point you make around like the spectrums and i've kind of not really thought about it that deeply because you think yeah well, well i'd listen to a podcast with peter atia who has the podcast the drive and he had an episode with inego milan who was a he's a mitochondrial expert and a professor at i think like the university of colorado or maybe california i can't remember and he was talking around tour de france riders and every Tour de France, and this is going to be a misquote, but it's like every Tour de France, each rider essentially will reduce their lifespan by about one year for like That's every crazy. race that they do because of the punishment they put through. Like by the time they finished the Tour de France, their body has gone into such a catabolic state that they are their bone density is already less than the 21 days before when they started. And it's like these guys it. are, yeah, it's it's the punishment they're putting through. And then your body, you're like, it's like having these car crashes for like 21 days, right? It's just this pure punishment to your body. So your body taking that in such a high dose for nearly a month is going to affect yeah. your life, right? For but sure. Like you said about muscle tears and things like that, like I've had tons of them. Like I've, I've had so many injuries that I just think, if you're going into sport, you need to, and you want to be a professional, you need to be so prepared for the sort of physical sacrifices that you're going to make, not just Absolutely. time sacrifices, the it's everything else that comes with it. Are you willing to like sit on a physio bed for some of your career? Like have times where it sucks, have times where you're well, like, and in pain. post post career too. Like yeah. so many people leave their careers and have to have major surgeries, right? Or even injuries that lead to tendonitis of some sort or yeah. even like arthritis so like we wake up in the morning and we're like oh man my my ankles are stiff like i feel like i'm i'm 20 i'm 28 today but sometimes my body feels like it's 60 you know so mm -hmm. it, we are aging i think a little bit the body anyway faster than than it should be um but yeah that's just sacrifices that come with with yeah, I I, I, the cricketers have we we catch obviously these really solid balls and we don't have gloves or anything, so we're catching it with bare hands and they're just rock hard stones, right? They're just so solid and like I've broken fingers, dislocated fingers, and had to like refix them on the field and take just take them up and crack <laughs> on and carry on. And and I, I know like this finger's got like a bone spur in it that's definitely just growing, and it's like if you see wicketkeeper hands that have eat, they've even got gloves and padding, but they take they're taking 500 catches like all the time and they are they're like pros that have played for years and years and years I only played for six years but guys that might have had 15 20 year careers their their fingers are just like they've yeah they, they look like they're they're just falling off and they're just completely constantly broken and uh it's just one of those things it's like you your punishment for it I listen to MMA fighters who look incredible athletes like they're these guys that can mold their bodies when they're fighting into these incredible positions but you listen to their plethora of injuries that they've got like they can't they can't sh they can't wash their backs in the shower because their shoulders are so bust from arm bars and and all sorts that they they they're just not functioning anymore so yeah. um yeah that that punishment catches up with you and it's something that you have to be willing to sign up for totally yeah a lifetime look, look nicole this is uh this is actually come towards the end so thank you so much for your time 
Um, yeah, before you. we before we kick off and we, we finish up, I always ask people, what is something that you're perhaps watching, reading, that uh, maybe it's a quote, film, or a documentary, or a book that you recommend people uh, that has been something that's inspired you? Oh, man. I think lately we just finished watching actually a docuseries on um, emergency rooms in New York. Is that, yeah, I actually, watched the first episode. That was really good. Yeah, yeah, we finished it yesterday. So that's kind of what I've, I think, the the last thing I watched. Yeah, and, and what, what sort of did you get? I mean, you've taken interest from the medical side as well, I'm sure. But like what, just for, for people that haven't seen it, what, what's in it? What, what, what sort of goes on? Yeah, I think it's just, um, it's based out of New York and multiple hospitals there. And just the, the, it's a docu series around the life of the doctors and the nurses, and they really, really show the cases that come in, and all of I think a big aspect is all the the gun shootings that happen in in New York, right. and yeah, how it happens. A lot of they focus a lot on pediatrics as well, so it's really interesting for me. Um, and watching those kind of shows, I just I like to pay attention to what what they're doing, what the nurses are doing, and obviously pay attention to the story as well. But it's an extra layer for me of, of, uh, curiosity when I'm watching, but yeah, it just kind of shows different cases and the reasoning behind them and how the, like we here in Canada, we call it, um, stars, which is the helicopter, like mm-hmm. the nursing that happens in, in helicopters and yeah, pediatrics, adults, yeah, um, the older, older population. There's just some interesting cases. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really well, uh, designed. Awesome. And lastly, if people want to get in touch with you, where should we send them? Um, I would say Instagram is probably where I'm mostly active on. And it's Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, underscore, underscore, Silvera. So S-I-L-V-E-I-R-A. That's no worries. We'll link, we'll link that in the show notes. But um, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.